Hello, welcome to the last week of lectures for this course. This week we're going to cover chapter 23, 24, 25, and 26. However, several of these chapters we're not going to be covering in great detail, so don't get too scared yet. So in chapter 23, it covers quantitative genetics and multifactorial traits. Many of the disorders that we've talked about in this semester rely on single gene mutations or changes. However, many traits actually involve multiple different genes at the same time. And a lot of these traits are going to show a continuous range of phenotypes. So if some terms for you, if we're talking about um, continuous variation, when you measure it and you describe it in quantitative terms, uh, it can be known as quantitative inheritance. If something is this continuous quantitative trait, it's often the result of these polygenic inheritance, and it's frequently multifactorial or has many different genes involved. So these multifactorial or complex traits are the result of both gene action as well as environmental influences. So things like um, infant weight at birth is a lot of environmental influence as well as genetic component to it. And things like height of individuals is definitely going to have a strong environmental component as well as a genetic component to it. Um, things like meristic traits, they're going to be polygenic traits. But in these cases, instead of being this um, gradation of phenotypes, they're going to be recorded by counting whole numbers. So if we're looking at peas, for example, a particular pod may contain two seeds, four seeds, six seeds, but it's not going to contain 5.75 seeds. Now, if you look at these on average, it may average out to 5.75, but an individual pod is only going to have a discrete number of seeds in it. Additive alleles are going to contribute to a single quantitative character. Um, so things like uh, skin color. can uh, The more that you have of a particular type of allele, um, the darker the skin color is going to be. And the fewer that you have of a particular type of allele, the lighter your skin color is going to be. And so they're going to contribute to this single quantitative character. Uh, the phenotypic contribution of each additive allele is approximately equal. And so when you add them all together, you can produce pretty substantial phenotypic variation. Uh, these polygenic traits are usually measured in a sample of individuals that is large. And you have to look at something that is going to be representative of the population from which it's drawn. So, for example, if you're looking at something like uh, height, you're going to want to make sure that you get people from all different nationalities, all different backgrounds, all different countries of the world, because they're all going to have different environmental components to their genetic component as well. The data that we find is going to form this normal distribution. This is the term used from statistics. It's a, that characteristic bell-shaped curve uh, when you plot it as this frequency histogram. So you've probably seen this in terms of things like IQ, right? IQ is supposed to center around 100, uh, but there's standard deviations on either side that people, most people are going to fall within. Okay, so it might look something like this. If you're counting individuals, you know, a certain number of them might have a particular height or weight uh, and so on on either end of the bell curve. Uh, the mean is going to be the arithmetic average of a set of measurements. The variance is going to be the average square distance of all measurements from the mean. So this variance is going to provide information about the spread of data around the mean. Is the data clustered very tightly around this mean or is it spread out pretty far? Okay. Talking, speaking about standard deviation, standard deviation is the square root of the variance. More than 95% of all values are going to be found within two standard deviations to either side of the mean. And this is going to assume if something is following a normal distribution. So in this case, um, if you're looking at one standard deviation, you're going to include 68% of the sample. Uh, close to two, you're going to have 95%. If you go to three standard deviations, you're going to include 99.7% of the population. So nearly everyone's going to fall within this. Now, if you're looking at something light height, surely you know there are people who um, have gigantism and they're going to be very, very tall, uh, or people who are very, very short and they may fall outside of this spectrum, but most people are going to be within this particular um, variance. When you're looking at many of these traits, it is handy to use identical twins where you can. The reason for this is because it's going to, there should be no genotypic variance. These identical twins should have identical background. 
So any variance that you're seeing between them must be due to environmental variance. You can also look at the difference in concordance in, uh, for a given trait in identical twins versus fraternal twins. Since these fraternal twins were, were raised theoretically in the same environment, you can see um, how closely if something has a genetic component that's going to be involved in the determination of the trait. So you can kind of compare the two types of twins. Is it more due to genetics or is it more due to an environment? You can really um, tease out that answer by looking at these different sets of twins.